Hey, 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 guys. What's going on? Hey, <clears throat> great to see you all out there. It's just awesome to uh, be here hanging out with you guys. I think my mic's a little hot. <laughs> so, um, so it's just an awesome privilege to be here. Uh, it's just something I look forward to every Monday. I really, really am happy to be here, particularly today. The sun's shining. It's bright outside. The weather's getting better. Spring has sprung. Uh, my gardening season has started officially, and uh, I'm actually clawing back from the dead. I may actually get a new building tomorrow. To uh, So getting inching back slowly but surely um, in, this, in this New York City that's a dead man walking. So let me just say hello to all my peeps out there in the chat. We got a we got a big show for you today. Um, Baz Hud, that's a new name. Hey, great to see you. Sea Cow three thirteen, I know that name. Nancy Graham, how you doing? And my man Mikey Morales, Kay Schreiber, Melissa, Faye Page, hey Sheila, and of course we got the Moet in the house. Bake Light, Scott, everyone's here. It's two shovels. What's going on? Yo, the gang. Hey, book club. What's going on, my man? Gang's all here. So, um, let me just minimize that screen. So we got a lot to do for you today. Today's going to be a good show. We're going to be talking about um, the Steinberg case. Uh, so I'm seeing here, Sandy Smith is saying that there's an echo. Anybody else experiencing that echo? If you are, please let me know in the chat and I'll figure out a way to, uh, to, to, to fix that. I don't know. Sometimes that just happens to individuals for some reason. Um, so yeah, we're going to be talking about the Steinberg case today. We, we actually had a show on it many months ago. I remember, I remember I had teased this, uh, Geez, now going back about six months ago, back in the crowdsource the truth days, which seems like you know ancient history. Um, and we did a show on it with the great uh, reporter Ellis Hennigan, the the uh, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter who had written an article talking about Joel Steinberg possibly being in the Phoenix program, and it was an interesting show. But then we got so busy back again with Son of Sam that we kind of put Steinberg on the uh, on the back burner until now. Um, and the reason I'm doing this is because, well, we had a lull, a little, little lull period in Son of Sam. We're sort of consolidating behind the scenes where uh, a lot is happening, a lot of a lot of extremely potentially explosive stuff is happening right now behind the scenes uh, that hopefully I'll be able to make some announcements on in the next couple of weeks. Some really a potentially huge project, uh, Son of Sam related. Uh, could be forming right now as we speak. And I'm going to leave that a little mystery for you guys. And, uh, you know, maybe we could all figure it out as time goes on. But yeah, it's time to get into Steinberg. And, and, and the main reason is because there's some parallels in these cases, as we'll talk about today. So the great Mike Codella is going to be with us a little later. Uh, he's not starting the show with us today, mainly because I have a little bit of information to get through before we actually get to his segment. So, the, the, so Mike will be with us shortly. Just a couple of programming notes. Um, so something huge happened last week. Uh, the Mike Lorenzo came into all of our lives. Who's Mike Lorenzo? He is a former Yonkers detective. Um, hard-nosed dude about as salt of the earth as they come one of the nicest guys that i've ever met in my life i i cold called him because i had a question about um his dad was a detective working on the berkowitz case in yonkers when when david berkowitz was you know throwing bombs shooting dogs allegedly and sending letters all over town so i had called him uh mike about uh, uh, a quote that his father gave in the newspaper and this guy couldn't have been nicer invited me up to his place uh, we sat down for hours and he's quickly become a huge friend of the show and he gave us these documents from his father's uh is uh, from his father's work in the yonkers police department as a detective and there are explosive there's explosive material in there we're dealing with it right now on my members exclusive but i'm going to give a guy a plug maybe i shouldn't do this but i'm but i'm going to give a, a a fellow youtuber a a, a free plug and and he's going to be shocked with how many people go and watch how many views he gets tonight after after i mention this so this is a guy who I, i've actually i've never met never spoken to him but for some reason he's always kind of had this weird thing with me and always was insulting me calling me shit for brain saying i was a process anchor baby saying i was the 
the the love child of Berkowitz and Shayna Glassman, all, even though I'm older than Shayna Glassman. <laughs> Um, yeah, I never took it seriously. I actually found the guy entertaining. And who am I talking about? Well, I'll, I'm going to give him a plug. Why? Because he's he's turned around. He's becoming more gracious with me. So I'm going to I'm going to return the favor. And this is Professor Thomas Horan. I know people out there are in shock hearing me say this, hearing me plug this guy. Um, but I find him entertaining. And, and even when he insults me, I find it entertaining. But uh, he did something important yesterday, which which I, I want to give him kudos and credit for. He um, he did a show on the Lorenzo files. He's the first YouTuber in the true crime son of Sam world to actually realize the importance of this besides us, right? We were the, we were the people that brought these to the, well, Mike was the people who brought them to the world, but he did a great show. Um, I'm not sure I agree with every one of his conclusions, but he really analyzed these documents and he did a great job. I'm going to, I'm going to say, uh, so if you go to his website, it's just professor dad on YouTube. Don't do it now. I don't want you guys to, to, to leave my show, but, um, but yeah, you know, book club is saying he obviously follows you on locals since he took the documents. Look, everybody watches each other, whether they wh whether they profess to hate each other or not. Yeah, everybody's looking at each other's work. So I I'm happy that people are taking this and running with it. I I've always said I have no ego when this is involved. I'm interested in the case. I'm not interested in 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 this BS personality cult and clashes. So my attitude is if this guy's willing to um, eat a little crow because he had to actually acknowledge that I did this work and he actually said said nice, some nice things about me, well, then I can switch my attitude as well and, and give him a shout out. So go check out his, his live stream. It's on his uh, thing. It's about maybe a third of the way in. Um, and he, he touches on some good points. And we will be having our own Lorenzo show next Monday. That's what Manny Monday is going to be about next week. So anyway, let's just get right into the material. So as I am wont to do, I made a little video for you guys that I'm going to sort of narrate over. So uh, let's just get this right up. And what's today's topic? Well, today we're going into the Steinberg case. But what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to tell you about the case. Most of you probably already know the, the you know, the details, but we're going to go into the details. But we're not going to go a normal route with this. This is something new. And there's information out there that we need to deal with regarding who? Well, regarding the spiritually sick botanist, Hedda Nussbaum. So um, so we're going to be dealing with Hedda. Uh, because Hedda has always been named as a victim in this, in this, in this crime. And, uh, I'm not so sure that we should be thinking of Hedda Nussbaum as a victim. In fact, uh, we're going to learn that she was, um, extremely spiritually sick, just a sick person. Um, and, uh, there's a lot of evidence that she was equally culpable with Joel Steinberg in this and p possibly even worse than Joel, if that's possible. So let's get right into this. Well, let's talk first, of course, about <clears throat> little Lisa Steinberg. Well, little Lisa Steinberg was, of course, six years old um, when she was essentially found dead in the arms of Joel Steinberg. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But she was born on May 14th, 1981, a fellow Gemini. No, she's a Taurus. I'm a Gemini. I was born on May 21st, 73. So I'm um, totally screwed astrologically. <laughs> uh, and she was born to a woman named Michelle Launders. Now, who was this Michelle Launders? Well, she was a 19 year old uh, from Long Island who um, was essentially poor, wasn't ready to give, you know, have a baby, but she also didn't want to have an abortion either. So she went to a doctor who said to her, hey, I can help you out. No problem. It, 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 super easy. I, I have a, I know a, I can get your kid adopted. I know a perfect family that'll take him, the Steinbergs. So they actually worked out what, what turned out to be an illegal adoption, uh, interestingly enough. And I think that that actually is a huge part of wh what eventually is going to become the uh, facts of this case. But as you can see in these pictures, little Lisa was precocious. She was extremely comfortable in front of a camera 
things that I think that you're going to want to keep in mind as well as we talk about um, this case today. Uh, just how comfortable she was in front of a in front of a camera, right? Uh, read between the lines, guys. Okay, <laughs> let me just grab a little water. So she, um, hey, is Professor Hamamoto here? Cool. All right. How you doing, Prof? Good to see you. I didn't see you in the chat, but I see someone answering you. So, um, so yeah, she ended up with Joel and Hedda, Joel Steinberg and Hedda Nussbaum, probably the two worst people she could have ended up with. But um, Michelle Launders, her biological mother, had no clue. She thought that the kid was going to a family on the Upper East Side uh, that uh, was going to take care of her, give her the greatest of homes. And it uh, turns out that Joel Steinberg took her and Steinberg and Nussbaum were the people that kept her until, well, until Joel Steinberg walked out of that bathroom with her dead body in his hands, essentially, saying to the police, she ate something and passed out. She vomited. Okay. So this case was huge. This was a humongous case. And of course, this happened on um, November 2nd, 1987. I was 14 at the time. And, you know, as a New York City kid, I remember this very well. This was a humongous case. Now, was this the first kid ever found dead in a, in her in her in the apartment in, in New York City, beaten to death by their parents? No. And what we're seeing here is the House of Horrors. This is 14 West 10th Street, um, a brownstone in the very exclusive West Village neighborhood of New York City. These were not poor people. Joel Steinberg was a successful lawyer and Hedda Nussbaum was a very successful um, book editor and book writer. She worked for a random house. So therein lay why this case became such a media sensation to use Melissa's term right here. Perfect timing. OK, um, because the parents were, quote, respectable lawyer. And by the way, the building that, that they lived in, also Mark Twain lived there as well. And it's actually considered one of the most haunted buildings in all of New York City. So I went down and I videotaped the building. And actually, you can see this video. I, I just posted it on YouTube. It's called um, Steinberg and Sisman and all that stuff. So this became a humongous case and, um, you know, made national attention and one of and and of course the big deal in this was the fact let me just rewind just a tad here sorry the big deal in this in this was the simple fact that of course these were two pretty wealthy people so you can see here people magazine this was national and international news it made every newspaper magazine this was humongous okay so Basically, these are the two protagonists uh, of the story. On the left, you have Mickey Rourke. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you have uh, Hedda Nussbaum. Uh, Joel Steinberg beat her so much um, that she actually looks like Mickey Rourke. I mean, it's uh, it's an uncanny uh, uncanny uh, um, uh, uh, similarity of resemblance. And uh, listen, Hedda, you might be watching this right? You and Joel are both still alive. I know that you live in Westchester and I know, Joel, you live in Harlem. You know, maybe we're going to talk to you. You know, we, we have to, we have some things to talk about with you guys. But in either case, these were the two protagonists, Hedda Nussbaum here on the left. And of course, the infamous Joel Steinberg on the right. So essentially at 14 West 10th Street, the House of Horrors, the cops came in on November 2nd, 1987, and they knocked on the door. When they, when opening the door was the shadowy figure of Hedda Nussbaum. Now we're seeing here, let me just, let me just get this off the screen, was the shadowy figure of Hedda Nussbaum. Um, the cops thought she was an old woman, right? She wasn't, she was actually younger than me right now, right? I think she was only like 45, right? But she had been beaten so much that she looked like an old woman. And also, she was on major drugs. She didn't eat properly. Joel was extremely abusive. Now, we're going to learn some things about Hedda. Hedda. Hedda was not an innocent person in all of this. But um, in either case, Hedda answered the door. And pretty soon after, Joel Steinberg walked out of the bathroom carrying a naked Lisa Steinberg in his arms, limp, saying, 
uh, hey, uh, she ate something and vomited and, uh, you know, uh, I don't know what's going on here. Right. And so the cops noted bruising on her body. They took her to the hospital where she was in basically in a, a, in a coma and um, never got out of the coma. And it was there were some red flags that happened. OK, so what happened was this guy, Joel, right, who here in this photo looks like, you know, decent father. Right. And weirdly enough, some people said that he was actually a very doting father, very good to Lisa. But in this picture here, you could actually see bruises on Lisa's face. And it's kind of just a strange picture all around. I don't know, like the way he's positioned behind her is weird to me, but maybe that's just my own my own interpretation. But this guy was a scumbag. He he at the hospital, the doctor says, well, she may make it, but she's going to have brain damage. Right. And 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 Joel Steinberg's answer was, well, he got real happy. Right. He was like, OK, so what you're telling me is she's not going to be an Olympic athlete, but she's going to make it right. You know, like that was this guy's mindset. <laughs> he wasn't worried about her being a vegetable. He just wanted her to live. Because he knew that if she died, he was going to be in serious trouble. And of course, a couple of days later, they took her off life support and she did, in fact, die. Now, what was interesting is that you see here in the news articles, Hedda Nussbaum became the poster child for um, spousal abuse. In fact, she was portrayed as a victim of this. She testified at the trial about how horrible Joel was. And listen, all that stuff was most likely true. OK, but certain elements of Hedda's character, certain elements of her past, certain predilections she had, certain things that she enjoyed um, never came out in the trial. Uh, and these are the things that we're going to deal with today on uh, uh, with um, the great Mike Codella. And so, of course, Hedda was shown as a victim here. She looks like a strung out junkie, which was which was she what she was. Essentially, she was on massive freebasing coke. She was, uh, you know, just just a, just a real mess of a human being. But she was considered a victim. And I think that that's where everything went wrong in this case. So. All right. Great. <laughs> You know, a crime in New York City, you know, whoop de doo right? There's a million of them every day. Uh, why are we interested in this particular case? Well, don't forget, we are Son of Sam researchers, okay? We are interested in Yonkers and Son of Sam and all this stuff. So we're interested in this case because Maury Terry was interested in this case. In fact, he wrote, a, um, he was the first author along with a woman named Joyce Johnson, who we're going to talk about, um, who actually brought up the whole notion of Hedda Nussbaum's culpability, her blame in all of this. And there were some very intriguing things that came out of these this reporting. So this is an actually a very unknown article written by Maury Terry. He doesn't even have a byline in it. And it's called Joel Steinberg's version. Now, we are interested of course because of the maury terry connection but we are interested in this here note joel steinberg the son of a lawyer grew up where yonkers yonkers new york and graduated from where charles gorton high school the same high school that jellyhead john weedy's car graduated from okay just a mere uh, well, he was older. He he he. Jellyhead John graduated in '64, so we're talking six years older. Okay, but Joel Steinberg was from Lake Avenue. Everyone, he was from that area. He was right right in there. Okay, and he graduated at the age of 17. He was a member of the football and swimming team and captain of the golf team. Among the class predictions in the Gorton yearbook was the guess that Joel Steinberg would be a, an oil millionaire by '73. And under the class last will and testament was something even more interesting. One of the items consigned to the incoming seniors was Joel Steinberg's alibis. So what this tells me is that Joel Steinberg was a major compulsive liar. And of course, um, once you get to know Joel Steinberg, the character a little more, it definitely comes into play that this guy was um, essentially one of the biggest bullshit artists that you could ever imagine. So. 
this is actually a great time. We have the one and only great Mike Codella. He just joined us in here. So why don't we get him in? I'm going to give him one of my famous intros because, you know, Mike deserves it. He's a great guy. He's always been a great friend of the show. So without further ado, let me just get my lips. <clears throat> let me clear my throat. <clears throat> Everybody get ready for the one. Uh, the only <laughs> Mike, Mike Codella. There he is. <laughs> Boom, buddy. <laughs> wow, that's some introduction. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's only that's only given to the great, the greatest of friends. It's the greatest Thank of you. friends. Yeah, that was great. Thank you, Mike. So, hey, we really appreciate you joining us. And boy, you came in right at the perfect time because we just started analyzing this article. And of course, everybody remembers the great Mike Codella from um, when we were talking about Eton Pates and Tiny Lentini and, and Carlton Daniel Gajusek. And in those in those months when we were dealing with um, Mike Codella a little bit more, he said something to me that was uh, intriguing, and I kept in, in the in the mental in the mental uh, filing cabinet, which was that he had some information on Steinberg as well. Now I'm going to hear it for the first time that you guys are hearing it tonight because that's that's how mm -hmm. I roll. I, I never like I never like knowing things. I like learning them in real time with you guys. So what I thought I would do was get Mike on here to um, let's go through this article together, uh, the salient points of the article, and then maybe you can um, speak on some of these issues that we that we bring that we bring up. So everyone should just understand that we've kind of um, laid down the baseline story, right? sort of wealthy couple, lawyer, book editor, uh, illegally adopt a baby. They find this, they find the girl dead six years later. And in the interim, there's all this, like, what happened to her? What was her life like in these six years? And so the, and so Maury Terry, uh, came up with some intriguing thoughts. And then Joyce Johnson in the book, what Lisa knew, which we'll talk about really brings it home. And, and that's kind of where I want to focus today's talk. So Mike, without further ado, thank you very much. I'm going to get this uh, this on the screen here, and maybe we can look at it together. So here we go. On the morning of November 19th, Joel Steinberg was watching television in the hospital on Rikers Island, where he is being held. Remember, this was written in real time. Maury wrote this in real time. Uh, where he is being held in protective custody without bail for the second degree murder of Lisa Steinberg, the child he and Hedda Nussbaum illegally adopted six years ago. His attention was call caught by Geraldo Rivera's talk show. The discussion that day was about satanic cults and I was one of the guests because six months earlier I had published a book on the subject as it related to the sensa several sensational murder cases, including the Son of Sam case, the Charles Manson murders, and the Andrew Crispo affair. We talked about the crimes committed by certain cults, including the ritual abuse of children. Okay, so here's where it gets starting to get serious. Within hours, Steinberg asked Mel Serkin, an attorney friend, to obtain a transcript of the show and a copy of my book, The Ultimate Evil. Two weeks later, Serkin phoned Detective Kurt Jackson, who had also appeared on the show, and Jackson put him in touch with me. Did you know this guy, Jackson, Mike? Um, you know, I knew a few of the detectives that worked the case, um, but they had long since been gone when I had spoken to them. I'm mm -hmm. not, to be honest, I'm not sure if he was one of them. Okay. So Jackson put him in touch with me and the me here that we're talking about guys is Maury Terry. Okay. Joel hasn't said a word publicly since he was booked, Sirkin said, but he'd like to see you. There's cult involvement in this case and he thinks you'd understand and be able to get to the bottom of it. So let's maybe get a little bit more background on this, Mike, and then maybe you can start telling us like what's going on with this. So, okay, I can't read the top here because it's blocked by some of my stuff, but he goes, I met Joel Steinberg for the first time in a makeshift conference room at Rikers. Now, Mike, before I ask your opinion, I just want to say that this sentence bothers me because... When I first started in the Son of Sam business, I became, you know, friendly with um, with Carl DeNaro and I became friendly with Josh Zeman. And both of these guys told me straight up that Maury Terry was in the limousine that actually picked up Joel Steinberg from the uh, from the. Uh... Oh, no, you know what? 
no, no, I'm, I'm totally screwing up. I forget I was going to say that, that he picked him up from jail. Um, but it says here he met Joel for the first time. So actually that works. That's that's something that I, I just totally screwed up. So forget that, folks. All right. So he had dark curly hair and wore tinted aviator glasses, carrying a folder crammed with documents related related to his case. He reminded me of a leopard pacing in a cage. Although he was 46 years old and a wealthy criminal lawyer, his voice was whiny and insistent, and he spoke in choppy, disjointed sentences like a hipster. So, Mike, tell us before we get into the nitty gritty, tell us about this guy, Joel, a little bit more. Give us, uh, you know, your perspective from as a as a cop back in who was active, actually, back in 87. You were on the force. You were actually working sort of in that area on the East Village, but close enough that maybe you, you know, so let us know, like, what was your insight into Joel? Let's get a little bit of a feel for this guy. Well, um, down in Alphabet City, there was actually an attorney, defense attorney, that had a heroin a heroin uh, habit. And he lived in the project with two younger girls and their mother. And um Wait, was, an attorney lived in an attorney lived in the projects? Well, he had I don't know if he had another apartment, which I'm sure he probably did one off site, <clears throat> but okay. because he had such a bad habit, heroin habit, he lived and supplied heroin to these two younger girls, not kids, but teenagers, uh, and their mother. And he was a like a down and out looking guy, but he still maintained his law his law practice. In fact, the rumor was, I don't know how true it was, but they used to say that he was actually in front of a judge at some point uh with a with a client and he went looking for something in his pocket and he dropped the hypodermic needle right on the <laughs> right on the in front of the judge and the judge had him either reprimanded or arrested or whatever he did with him but um that uh -huh. was what that's what all all of the guys in uh avenue d all everybody knew him nobody had him as a nobody used him as their attorney because he was so uh screwed up in drugs but in any event he lived on Avenue D in the projects. And when this happened, um, I had a, a, a semi-friendly relationship with him. Um, although, you know, I had no qualms about locking him up and he knew that. But when this had happened, he told me that he knew Joel. He, he knew Joel. They were both defense attorneys. They were both from lower Manhattan. And he said he knew Joel. And he what he said was that Joel was a bad guy, that he was up to a lot of, a lot of stuff, a lot of bad stuff, and that he that Joel was a, uh, an addict. Uh, I, I don't remember if he said heroin addict. Now we know that he was smoking coke, crack, but free basing. He, yeah. Free basing. So he had known Joel. He said, Joel was up to all kinds of stuff. And, um, and now this is coming from this particular guy was a heroin addict himself. And he right. basically made me understand that, which I mean, is no secret, but that Joel was, uh, really in, in a, a bad dude, real bad guy. Did you know anything about these illegal adoptions and anything that was going on? Well, I learned later on when we were doing some stuff with the son of Sam, one, one or two of these detectives reached out to us. Now, I think they hadn't been on the case in years. In fact, they may have even been retired. I, I don't know. Uh -huh. uh, I don't remember, actually. But they had told me that uh, they had told me about the, the, the two kids. Um, they had the told two Steinberg me, kids. The two, right, the two supposed okay. adopted kids. Right. Um, um, I, they had they had known that the mother, the the supposed mother, had a Nussbaum, was um. She was, you know, of course, like you started to say earlier, she claimed to be uh, a victim. And right, you know, it's one. And thing the lawyers and the lawyers really pushed that too. I mean, they were they really pushed that angle big time. You know, I, I sympathize with victims, and I believe that women are victimized by men all the time. However, when your kids are involved, adopted or not, that kind of changes the playing field, um, in my opinion. Unless, right. unless you're taking part in in, in the, uh, you know, in the acts. Right. Espe well, especially since at the very least, we knew pretty much right away that Hedda Nussbaum was in the apartment with Lisa Steinberg for like 12 hours while Lisa was on the floor in the bathroom in a, in a coma. And Joel went out to like hang out with his buddies that right. Hedda was in the apartment doing filing Joel's papers. I mean, she said that. So it's unbelievable to me that she would have actually been portrayed as a victim after that information came out. And I'm pretty sure that that information came out fairly soon. No, but I, I could be wrong. 
Right, and she stayed there, and, and um, all she had to do was uh, obviously all she had to do was call nine one one on this, on this uh, right injured kid. Right, exactly, and so and so I, when I started researching this case a couple of years ago, uh, mainly because I was in those in those years I was really convinced that there was a you know a son of Sam cult up in Yonkers, and I was like Joel Steinberg had to have been involved with this, right? I've kind of calmed down a little bit about that, but I I can actually see the Steinberg case as more making more sense of like Maury's thesis as this like big con criminal conspiracy involving the high elites and child pornography and cults and that kind of stuff. I actually see that more in this case than in Son of Sam. And 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 of course we haven't gotten into the information about this cultic activity and that kind of stuff. But um, once we once we go along in this information, I think that the audience might might see it as well. So let's um, let's get back to this real quick, this uh, thing, and let's see if we can. So his logic was often difficult to follow. Drugs, I thought, or emotional strain. He insisted, however, that he was not a drug user. All right, Mike, let's speak to that. So he yeah. said he wasn't a drug user. <laughs> it was obvious he was a drug user. I mean, I think... Uh... I obviously he has since admitted to using drugs, but I think in the court, in the trial, obviously he admitted to using drugs. Right. And also let's not forget his high school epitaph. It said that Joel Steinberg's alibis, right? right. Like, like he was known in high school as a, as a huckster and a liar. Right. So it's interesting that, uh, that he would try to bullshit, um, Maury Terry. So over and over, he demanded to know how Hedda was. I need to see her. Can you get someone inside the hospital? If only I could hold her hand. Yeah. Now, Mike, do you know anything about like the relationship between Joel and Hedda? Like what kind of relationship did those people, did those two have with each other? You know, from what I remember, um, you know, it goes back to almost all of these things that you talk about, uh, Manny. You know, first of all, he had money. He was on fifth off of Fifth Avenue, mm -hmm. and it's not easy for a guy of that stature, so to speak, to go and buy crack cocaine, or for her, even for that matter. It, right. It, it's a lot easier, or makes a lot more sense, or just things facilitate a lot better, or groove a lot better when you when you're around the people that you can get it with without a stigma, or you know, like. Um, without having like a stigma put on you. And that's why a lot of these people get involved with these, uh, I don't want to use the word cults because I know that's, uh, but a lot of, that's why a lot of these people get involved with this stuff because they have other back, there's something in the background other than the, the drugs, what, what, whether it's a relationship with other women or swinging relationship or whatever right. it is. But in the, also part of it is the, the drugs. And the, obviously in this case, the heavy drug use. Right, the serious drugs, because in 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 Joyce Johnson's book, they talk about these people called the Green the Greens. Uh, that was that was their last name, and how they had a lot of power over Joel. Weirdly enough, and that but they were major like coke uh, dealers and and all that sort sort of crap. So let's carry on. Um, so here we're getting into the the meat of the matter. So slowly, he told a story which he has maintained in numerous meetings and endless phone calls, often as many as three in one day. From that, from that time to this, he said that Hedda Nussbaum had been immersed in a cult on Long Island from the late 70s to the mid-1980s, although the group was not satanic, right? Like Just like as you said, Mike, right? it didn't have to be a satanic cult, right? right. It, it was into sadomasochism and astrology and programming techniques. He said the group's membership consisted primarily of upscale professionals, attorneys, psychologists, and at least one medical doctor. It's very, very sophisticated, he said, and he urged Sirkin, Mulcahy, and me to read up on hypnosis and post-hypnotic techniques, which he said were employed by the cult. So now here it gets into the, the heart of the matter for me. Um, so here we are, right? We're back into the old familiar territory of uh, cults, drugs, swinging, sadomasochism, God knows what else. We're going to talk about child pornography in a little bit. What was your, um, what intelligence did you have on this and knowledge that you have on this I mean, aspect? From what, of I, what, what I had learned or gathered at some point um, was that it wasn't only, it was her, but it was him too. Like here he is. 
uh, doing what all criminals do. They take themselves out of the main part of it. Right. Right. <laughs> right. And, uh, he has the knowledge, but he's not involved, which of course is, you know, to him, you know, he, when they talk to investigators or detectives or whoever they're talking to, they think everyone is, uh, they think they're smarter than everyone. So here he is putting basically all the blame on Hedda Nussbaum and he's her, he was her savior and, uh, you know, she was involved with this, but he wasn't. Meanwhile, she was again, from what I understand, she was involved, but he was involved. It wasn't just her. In fact, he probably lured her in to it from what, from what I remember. Right, because if you read if you read these books on their relationship, he was extremely dominating, abusive, and um, to the point where he was like dressing her. He was telling her what he could, what she could eat, when when she could drink, right. and all sorts of weird stuff like that. So to me, like when he told Maury Terry, he was like, "I just want to call her. I just I I just want to reach out to her." To me, that seemed like almost like he wanted to make sure her story was 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 the right would you kind of agreed on that absolutely when you when i mean in any in any case when there's multiple defendants normally you want to separate them so they don't jive with the same story if they haven't prior to being arrested and that's right. what he's looking to do. he's trying to reinforce in her he was trying to get a reach out to her so he can reinforce what their story is and he was going to take care of everything don't talk to the cops and he'll talk to the cops this way he could he could sell his side of the story basically right and so what what kind of do you, do you know do you know anything about this group that she was involved with or that her and joel were involved with like what was what who were they where were they what were they doing and and all that kind of stuff i remember um not so much the long island group but there was also a group on the west side up uh manhattan's west side in the west village that they were supposedly involved with um, oh really? I, tell yeah. tell us more about this. That well, that that was um, supposedly they were from the village in the west side, west west side of Manhattan, and mm -hmm. uh, that was like uh, from what I remember, their home. To, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> their home, their home, click so to speak. And again, right, it could have been where they were, where these people on the west side were scoring drugs for them, which was a lot easier than going out to Long Island. Um, but th I remember them supposedly being involved with a west side group of uh you know up to no group right basically. and this whole thing with you know obtaining this child illegally and not going through um normal back channels of adoption and 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 just the fact that these the child was given to the steinbergs by a well a long island doctor you know probably not a poor guy probably somebody who was you know fairly wealthy uh, so that speaks to an illegal baby ring being run by elitists. And whenever I hear that, I immediately think, well, what are they using these children for? Like, what was the fate of Lisa Steinberg? And um, let's see if we can glean a little bit more from that from these articles. So uh, so this is the one we just saw. Let's get to the next page. Give me a second here. All right. So to someone who has been investigating cult crimes for 10 years, remember, guys, this is Maury Terry speaking. It does not sound entirely crazy. A number of the purported cult members Steinberg has named proved to be traceable and friends of the Steinberg and Nussbaum, of, uh, Nussbaum have corroborated his statement. A Manhattan attorney who went sailing to Fire Island with them said Hedda was all out of it like she wasn't even there and saying that she was in the twilight zone. Um so there's child pornography. It, um, I'm just seeing here. So this is about how terrible she looked and uh, she had tie. Oh, wait, here she had tie. So here's Hedda herself saying. Here, here. So here's a person saying that she hadn't seen Hedda in quite time, but it was clear that her scars and such were old. I told her that she should have plastic surgery and wanted to know what happened. She said she had been tied with this cult on Long Island and was knocked around by them. She wouldn't give many details except to say that a doctor and his wife were part of it. So, I mean, do we know anything about this this group? Like anything more specific, Mike? No, no, I don't. You never heard any, 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 no. Did anybody ever investigate these claims? Um, to be honest, I don't remember the detective telling me whether he did or didn't. Whether he did or didn't. Right. And so, and so, yeah, so. You know, what's interesting is that uh, so she's talking about a Long Island cult 
Now, somebody here, Steinberg denies being a member of the cult himself. He also denies beating Hedda Nussbaum and says that Hedda participated in sadomasochism only to heighten her sexual pleasure. So, Mike, that speaks to him again, trying to take himself out of this. Right. 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 And what was, what was she doing having sexual pleasures without him? And how could without he, him? How could she be involved with that? Him not being involved with that. Either they both were or they both weren't. That's the bottom line. Exactly. Uh, and, and, if, and, and that book, again, what Lisa knew really lays this out and we'll, we'll show people some, uh, slides from that at the uh, end of the show. So what I'm interested in here is, uh, so, all right. So I remind him of a partial listing of items seized by the police in his and Hedda's, Hedda's apartment a 45 caliber, small quantities of heroin, Coke, and marijuana scales, crack pipes, drug recipe cards, plus books about psychology and demonology and two boxes of leather belts with chains, dildos, latex molds, vibrators, and other sexual devices. Steinberg says that the drugs were not his and the sexual paraphernalia were not his and that everything else was a gag. Uh, unbelievable. Unreal. Right. I mean, it's crazy, <clears throat> but you know, let me, let me, let me, let's see what's, what's next. All right. So, before we get into Hedda, so this whole thing with child pornography is something that I want to ask you about and, and, and deal with because my spidey senses, and I'm not a policeman, I'm not a detective, I'm not a trained investigator, but my spidey senses are telling me that these people, Hedda and Joel, were trafficking this kid. And that's probably one of the reasons why they wanted her not to be in the system, right? They didn't want this adoption to be legally noted. So they could just essentially have this untraceable kid that they can do whatever they want with. And in the book, What Lisa Knew, there's a lot of, let's just say, allusions and, and, and sometimes just straight out allegations that Lisa Steinberg was used as a, a child pornography model. Do you have any insight or or any anything related to um you know i know it's a very distasteful subject but you know this is what we deal with here you know one of the things i always said was that lisa knew how to pose in front of a camera and she was extremely gregarious she was able to speak to adults like like a fellow adult you know it speaks to someone who grew up quick and who was in front of a camera a lot so do you have any insights into that mike no the only, you know like like you touched on earlier the whole um Illegal adoption is just really a, really a strange, a strange thing, you know. And and without the legal paperwork, I mean, I hate to say it, but this could actually could have disappeared without with, with very little. Um, with, right, with like noticing this, this kid was even existed in their house. Well, that's what's interesting to me because they did call nine one one eventually, but what if they hadn't? they could have just dumped her body somewhere in the river and no one would have ever known. Right. Um, so it, it, it is curious that they actually did call nine one one. It speaks to some form of humanity in them because yeah, they could have just, you know, dropped it like a, like, you know, like a garbage in a sense. And why, but, would, they, uh, why would, why would they not choose to adopt legally if they were um, on the up and up? I mean, he was a successful attorney who made a lot of money. Um, I think he would have been right. fine trying to adopt or, for, and back, or even foster a child. Right. And back then, it's not like New York City had major, even to this day, it's not like they have major, they had major background checks. He would have probably been considered a great candidate, you know, wealthy, well to do, and all that kind of stuff, white, educated, um, and so on and so forth. But you never heard of any um, corroboration or any, any, any evidence that um, bespeaks to, Lisa being used as a model in some way? No. Do you have any thoughts on your own about it that aren't? <clears throat> I think, like I, like I said, I think the mere fact of how they adopted this kid is um, would raise suspicions of what they were doing with her or plan to do with her either then or in the future. Did you ever hear that he would, because it's this, this I read about, that he would bring lisa to business meetings at a, at a local restaurant in the village and where you know where she would like entertain the adults everybody was like wow this this girl's great she's like another adult and she would like entertain his clients and part of me wonders if he was selling her if he was brokering her 
to some people out of this restaurant. But, you know, it's just my thoughts. I don't have any proof. But it right. seems to me, like like you say, Mike, that something weird was going on with this illegal adoption because why would they not want her to be traced? Right. And, you know, he also had another, Joel Steinberg also had another daughter that would that died. Yes. Um, I think her name was little, Dawn. He had the little boy, too, that they adopted the same way. Uh, true, right. Little Mitchell, who who they found, you know, soaking in his own urine, tied up to his uh, his pit, his playpen. So there's definitely stuff to unpack here, Mike. Um, uh, uh, do you have anything to um, close out? Any other thoughts? Because uh, I, I'm going to go to my next segment where I don't I don't you could stick around if you want, but I don't necessarily need you. No, that's fine. Th thanks, man. You know, I'm not, I have nothing else, really. OK, great. So perfect. So thanks a lot, Mike, for joining us. We'll be in touch soon. We got some things that we're going to be working on behind the scenes that hopefully we can get you involved with. So we're going to talk to you very soon. Oh, real quick. Um, maybe would you mind if I'm going to put out there in the audience, just stick around for a minute or two. I'm going to put out there if anyone has any questions for Mike, you can call in. Is that cool? Yeah, sure. All right, cool. So uh, anybody in the audience, if you want to call in uh, and have a question for Mike, try to keep it on topic to Steinberg. But if you have any questions for Mike. Um, so, Mike, as we're as what we're waiting for people, let's just carry on, because maybe you'll find this interesting. And, and if nobody shows up in a minute, then then we'll, we'll say goodbye. Sure. So Hedda is somebody that I want to talk about more because Joel, as you know, Mike, got all the um, got all the. Uh, the attention up oh, we got eric well he got eric so the one the, <laughs> the only can you hear uh, me yes hey eric how you doing Hi. good to see you again hey how are I, you um very well uh, fighting as all of us mike two quick questions the first i don't want to be intrusive because i'm not disrespectful sometimes names can't be named is the detective who gave you this information still alive? And did he ever provide for you names of the professionals involved in that Long Island, what seems to be a new age group with sadomasochism? Um, I, to be honest, I, I don't know if he's still alive. I haven't spoken to him since probably 1996 or 97. Was he a Nassau County uh, detective? No, he was working... No, no, he was a, 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 a NYPD uh, detective. And did anybody ever scrutinize seriously, meticulously, the adoption records and the history of the adoption agency that gave the child over? No, Eric, there wasn't one. It was illegal. The, the, it didn't. She didn't come from an adoption agency. No, it was in a totally underground black market illegal adoption. The mother gave the child to no. them. The no. mother, the mother gave a child to the doctor who delivered her, and then that doctor knew Steinberg and gave it to Steinberg. Gave her to that Steinberg. That doctor has to be investigated. That his background must be investigated. That could be a racket. Physicians do that. Physicians are involved in these type of illegal channels. Mike, That's did you ever did you ever deal with stuff like that as a cop? Where you where you dealt with that type of activity? Oh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think so. To be honest, I don't remember. Dealing that wasn't that. like your beat, right? Like you no. were more of a, you were Rambo on the upper, on the lower East side. You weren't, you weren't dealing with the, the doctors and lawyers. No. Um, I'll off now, but I just want to say this, Mike, that there have been physicians who even make believe a child is very ill, has died, and it's given to someone else just to cash in on the money. They take advantage of certain parents. It's horrible. These I things do take place. Does she um? Does she name in her book Heather the doctor Manny? It, she does. I have to go get the book. I, today was kind of like the primer. I didn't want to get into like like sure. the super name details because I want to kind of keep this series going. But um, she, yeah, they do. They do name the doctor, wow. and uh, we can look this guy up and find out if he's still alive and maybe find him. Yeah. God yeah. bless you, Mike. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. Eric. Hey, thanks a lot. All right. So we got so everybody out there in the audience, if you have a question for Mike and you want to call in, please call. Please do. I just put the link in the chat. So, Mike, Professor Hamamoto, are you working on another book? I'm not currently working on another book. No. no. All right. Let's see if there's any other questions. And then we got Kathleen coming up, who's always great with her beautiful southern accent that we love so much. 
So um, let me see if there's any quick questions in the uh, in the chat here. Uh, yeah, Roro is correct. Yep, it was a private adoption and only doctors and lawyers involved. Very interesting. Um, here's Brando saying Berkowitz is a dork. <laughs> We get them all, Mike. We get them all. All right, so let's get let's get Kathleen. Kathleen, get yourself ready because we're ready for you, dear. Okay, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. Is this my Southern Kathleen or is no, this a new it's Kathleen? No, it's a new Kathleen. I just wanted to say that, as I recall, Lisa Steinberg was enrolled in school. She was. She was enrolled in the local Which, public school. Then she wasn't completely off the grid. They knew, and there was an investigation of why the school had not looked into why she had been out of school so frequently. There was a yeah. lot of absenteeism. So, so the, the system was aware of this kid. Oh, no doubt. People were calling in like crazy. People from the building, Kathleen. Um, yeah, but I'm saying even governmental because she was in school. Right, you know, you're I mean, right. This complaining was one thing, but there was a, the school knew about her. We're going to we're going to deal with enrolled her in school even is an interesting situation. I mean, it was a private adoption, which is not illegal. Right. And that's not necessarily black market, although it was. But I don't think anybody had any way of knowing that at the time. You you you're you bring up excellent points, uh, Kathleen. Boy, you, you sound like a are you a cop, Kathleen? No, just been around a long time. <laughs> <laughs> you sound but great. I, do, I remember this case. I watched the court case on television oh yeah exactly you know this was the first televised court case in american history i believe yeah it was quite it was a big deal in new york i mean it was a huge huge deal but you know what I, I mean i was only a kid at the time i was 14 you guys were older than me and maybe you remember more i don't remember ever hearing about illegal adoptions or child pornography oh, yes. or sadomasochism well, did, did that I come mean, out i think in head and not news bombs trial it wasn't exactly came out, but it was pretty much, I mean, you could put two and two together if you were an adult and right. know what was going on. Right, but it they didn't actually, you know, they didn't explicitly say it. Yeah, it wasn't explicitly spelled out at the time, in my opinion. But I think the thing was that, the, the and the child being in this adoption with a private doctor, that's not illegal. I think okay. it might be now, but back then it wasn't. So what would be a better term, Kathleen? Would black market be better? No, it would... was a private adoption. Private adoption. Okay. That's all it was, was a private adoption. I mean, today, I don't know how much they're allowing that anymore. But back yeah. then, a woman could, and I knew of other cases. I knew of people who had done it. You know, where rather than have the child adopted through some kind of an agency, and you have no idea who's going to get the child, the mother might choose to work with the doctor. The doctor says, I know a lawyer who could place your child with a very good family it's somebody with money you know i mean this is kind of the way it goes right and oh. some and some adoptions were actually open at one point where the where the mother of the child would know who had the child and where the child was oh really that's interesting i don't know if they're allowing any of this anymore but back then there was a, a it was actually a trend i think at the time i wonder if the steinberg case changed um you know the adoption game at all I Probably. think it might have. I think it might have had an effect of because in the first place, years ago, when somebody adopted a child, they were investigated down to their drawers. Right. You know, they didn't just let anybody come in and adopt a child. Right. Then this whole thing happened with private adoptions, and I guess they were taking. It was kind of looking at 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 it like the child was a a commodity, somebody that belonged to you. Right. Exactly. You know, where, where prior to that, the state looked at the child as as belonging to the community and so they were looking for the best interest of the child not what the mother wanted kathleen or mike maybe either of you can answer this so all right correct it was a closed uh, cl like a closed adoption a private adoption but there still had to be legalities like documentation and i just wonder whether there were any in this in this particular oh, I case think there were. i think there were because he enrolled her in school hmm okay all right, so you know the plot you thickens. No guardianship to enroll her in school, I believe. Yeah, I mean, I wonder how easy it is to fake those 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 papers, especially if you're a. I'm not saying that he did, but you know, he was a well connected. You know, some people say he was very connected to mobsters and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, but you know, you have to have a birth certificate. 
issued by well this child was born on long island so i'm saying i guess it would be suffolk county or or nassau county had right. to have issued a birth certificate and playing with birth certificates is not an easy game i mean i can i can imagine yeah you know these are all excellent questions and and, so and issues think, that you bring up i think it, i think the adoption was pretty much legal okay all right well that's definitely a, good, a great perspective um it's and we appreciate it kathleen anything else no that's about it i just wanted to make sure that i met you know when you were saying about her being like off the grid she was off the grid off the grid she was known especially that she had been enrolled enrolled in school the schools were really negligent that school was and i think it was because of who he was that they were negligent it could be right because he had been he... a kid on the east, in the east village you know whose parents had no money they probably would have been looking into why this kid was out of school all the time right but exactly he was a lawyer and they had money and they were in the west village it was a different story so this case not only spoke to spoke to the issues of you know whatever these private adoptions but also to issues of class and race and all that kind of stuff well, it was kind of interesting seeing, even what we're seeing right now with this um anna <clears throat> inventing anna this woman who had milked you know the whole system in new york she's staying at the uh -huh. hotel for nothing. if you or i tried to check into a hotel we have to produce a, a credit card but this one looked like she would have money so they didn't ask her right i mean yeah there's still it still happens it's still and it, and i imagine the same thing could happen today because most likely people look at people with money differently than they look at people without money exactly and i think that that definitely played into this case for sure so all right kathleen okay. excellent call we really appreciate it we thank you so much and please please call back again on another another show all right i will thank you all right you got it all right uh mike so I know that you're a busy man and you probably got to got to run and I don't see anyone else coming in the uh, the chat here. So I just want to say thank you so much for your time today. Um, I don't think you have anything else to say, right? You're no. pretty much finished. All right. But you definitely gave us some some good insight and we and we really appreciate it. And, you know, maybe maybe as we advance in this, we'll 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 get you back. All right. All right, man. Thank you for having me, bro. You got it, my friend, and uh, stay cool, and we'll talk to you soon, all right? Talk soon. Yep, absolutely. All right. Take care, buddy. Bye, Bye guys. All right, so let's carry on with our little presentation because uh, I wanted to get all that on record. That was a great uh, discussion we had with Mike, and also um, Kathleen's insights were very, very interesting to me as well. So, like I said, we're going to carry on in this in this discussion today, and we're going to carry on with this case, uh, you know, as the months go by, because you can't do this case justice in one show. What I wanted to do today was establish Hedda as culp as potentially culpable, okay? Because um, it then brings into the note it br brings into this. Let me just get myself a little bigger here. It brings into this whole case the whole notion that Maury Terry was interested in, which was these Long Island cults. I think Book Club, even in the chat earlier, mentioned something about there being a rumor that Lisa Steinberg was brought out to Roy Radin's mansion. So for those who are like, well, Manny, you know, he, 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 he throws away everything Maury does and everything Maury do, did is wrong, right? That That's what Manny thinks. Well, in Son of Sam, I, I actually do think quite a bit of that. But in the Steinberg case is where I really, really think that these issues of elite cultists, pedophiles, satan um, sadomasochism, child pornography, child trafficking, all of these things that Maury tried to bring into Son of Sam, I actually think it belongs more into into Steinberg, and that's why I'm very interested. And we're gonna we're gonna explore that as we go along. But the but so so we already have established that this adoption, no matter what it was, was a little bit off. You know, it wasn't totally legit. Okay, whether it was legal at the time, we have to figure that out. But it wasn't like a normal adoption. They didn't really want the kid too much to be on the on the system's radar okay for whatever reason we've established that um 
Joel Steinberg accused Hedda Nussbaum of being into sadomasochism um, and into this Long Island cult activity, right? And what we're going to explore in future episodes is this whole idea of Lisa Steinberg being potentially trafficked and used as a, well, as a moneymaker for Joel and, and Lisa, uh, Joel and Hedda uh, to be used as a, as a, unfortunately, as a, in child pornography. And of course, then they had this other kid, uh, uh, Mitchell, which they, which they had just adopted as well in the same fashion. So I wanted to talk because today was head and us bound spiritually sick botanist. So we want to talk a little bit about this book. So head and us bound didn't always look like Mickey Rourke. Um, this is a picture of head and us bound probably when the beatings first started, but take a look at head and us bound before uh, she wasn't bad looking. Now, certainly wasn't a, a beauty queen or anything, but uh, there's plenty of guys back in the old days that would have, that would have, you know, had no problem with head and us bound. Okay, in fact, she looks like I used to be playing a band called Northern State. I used to be the drummer of this all female rap band called Northern State. They were from Long Island. This was in 2003 or four, and uh, there was a member of this group called Hesta Prin, H-E-S-T-A-P-R-Y-N-N-E. -E. If you Google Hesta Prin, spitting image to head a Nussbaum, okay? H Hesta, I hope you're not watching this, but you know what? You guys kicked me out of that band unceremoniously, so screw you. Um, but listen, after, a, after years and years of drug abuse, sadomasochism, spiritual sickness, and beating, this is what she turned into. Again, Mickey Rourke, uh, you know? But here is where it gets kind of interesting, all right? So remember, Hedda Nussbaum, according to Joel Steinberg, who is a pathological liar, okay? All right? All of this could be for naught. It could, because it, 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 again, this is Maury Terry taking Joel Steinberg's version. Okay. Even the article is written, Joel, the headline, Joel Steinberg's version. But um, this book is actually quite interesting if you read it uh, and look at it through the filter of Hedda into sadomasochism and Hedda into child abuse. So this is a book that she wrote and it was illustrated by a guy named Joe Matthew called Plants Do Amazing Things. Now, first things first, how sick is this cover, <laughs> right? Out of all of the things, now this is a book written for like six and seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds at the most, right? Out of all of the things you can put on a children's book about plants, if I would, like I'm a botanist, right? If I was writing this book, I would be putting a sunny sunflower with a smile on its face being fed by the sun and a few animals, goats, chickens smiling in the background and maybe a happy farmer in the background as well. But everybody would have smiles on their faces. There'd be nothing dark and evil. Why on the cover of her book does she have a Venus flytrap about to close in on a poor unsuspecting fly that's about to get killed and then i'm reminded of this photograph here on the right where in a sense symbolically in my opinion this is just me looking at this as a you know as a person who you know maybe is a little weird okay i admit it but rem if, if you read the book what lisa knew and that's your homework assignment for for our next show i want everyone to read what lisa knew i'll show you pictures of it in a, in a few minutes and read it through the filter of what you're learning today and read it through the filter of Hedda as culpable. And you will see in this photograph something that maybe you wouldn't see otherwise. Here she's looking coyly at the photographer, who's probably Joel. To me, this is a symbolic photograph showing the same exact thing that you see on this cover here on the left, a fly in a trap. That's what you're seeing here with little Mitchell being held by head of Nussbaum. Okay. Symbolically, it's the exact same thing. I find that very interesting. Maybe I'm wrong. Okay. But also I find her look here to be interesting as well. It's almost like a coy, 
sexual look like hey baby you know like look at the fun we're gonna have you know almost like a little hidden meaning in that eye in that look in her eyes to joel like yeah we've done this before and we're about to do it to this kid now i could be completely wrong this is just my opinion this is just the way i'm looking at this but i also wanted to look at some of the passages in this book as well so of course this is the front page and of course it was written in 77 you can see the uh well you just take my word for it um here's an interesting page because look who it's uh, dedicated to to murray who inspired this book to my few david who i hope this book inspires and to joel my everyday inspiration so this book is generally a pretty well-written book actually i have to say it, it I was a botanist and, and well, I still am, but I was a, um, a professor, a teacher at the New York Botanical Garden for 10 years. I taught this stuff. I taught, I still do privately. I taught plant science and soil science and all this kind of stuff. Honestly, Hedda Nussbaum was an excellent writer and an, and a, and amazing, um, had an amazing ability to uh, uh, to distill these concepts of botany into a way that, well, anybody could understand. I think that this is some great stuff. Okay, let me just get into um, full screen mode so I can read this. So, you know, the leaves of the plant move too. They move towards the light. Look at the plant. You know, all sorts of fun stuff and things that you could learn about plants. In fact, if you if you want a basic primer, buy this book. It's actually not bad. But there's certain passages in it that, that are weird. Now, this is a weird picture because, I don't know, this guy here, like if you look at this, I don't know, this just seems a little strange to me. And I and I know that I'm going I'm I'm like my reputation might be a little sullied because I'm analyzing this book from such a weird perspective. Yo, but this dude looks like Carlton Gajusek looking at a looking at a little boy. Like, is this like a weird little hidden message of pedophilia? Like, look at the way that that guy's looking at that little boy. Does that not look like Carlton Gajusek to you? Right? Same hairstyle, same sort of face, right? And then this kid's down here looking with a tear in his eye, right? As if he knows something bad is about to happen. That's very strange to me. All right, but maybe I'm weird. And then here it gets into another one of these strange passages, the meat eaters. Again, if I'm writing a book for children, I'm not going to be writing about plants killing animals. I might talk about a plant eating an insect, but I certainly wouldn't be having... A, Remember, anytime a book is published, it has to go through multiple levels of, of editing and producing, and somebody has to sign off on all this stuff. So these, these drawings were approved by people uh, and approved probably first by Hedda Nussbaum herself, right? This was her book after all. Why would you be putting pictures like this in a children's book of a mouse about to be killed, right? Talking about meat-eating plants right? It's kind of strange to me. And even again, the cover is freaking weird, man. This is evil and wrong and scary. This is not something that I would want my child to look at. Okay. So I find this weird. And now here is where, where again, if you read this with a certain perspective, insects are attracted to the shining drops and the sweet smell. An insect lands on a leaf. It gets stuck in the sticky uh, liquid, right? There's sexual overtones here, okay? The nearby hairs bend over it. They hold the insect down. It cannot escape. What a nasty trick. And then it goes on to talk about how the juice kills the insect and the insect can eat is eaten and digested. I mean, to me, that's a little um, too much information for a seven-year-old. And what's up with this bending over and holding down? That speaks to sadomasochism. Now, I could be wrong about this, but it seems to me like this book is a little sort of cryptic little inside joke almost. You know, like, haha, let me put this stuff in a children's book. Like here is, again, highly sexual. Along the rim of each leaf is a sweet liquid. The liquid attracts the insects. 
Once inside, an insect cannot crawl out. The sides of the leaf are slippery. And then here we talk about another insect that gets killed. And then, of course, look at the plant. It looks like a vagina. Okay. I mean, this looks like a vagina, right? I mean, maybe not a very pretty one, right? I mean, if I actually saw a vagina that looked like this, I would be horrified and <laughs> would run as far as I could the opposite way. But you could see that in here, right? It's very phallic. Here would be the, you know, like the clitoris. And it's just weird to me. So I wanted to just to put this out that to me, this is spiritually sick. I would not be putting this in a, in a, uh, in a children's book. And so to round out today, and if anybody wants to uh, call in and, and ask me any questions, feel free. But this is your homework assignment for, um, for, uh, for next, the next time we talk about this. We're going to analyze the passages in what Lisa knew in, in light of this information that there could be um, child trafficking, child pornography, right? Them trafficking Lisa as an object. You know, one of the things that, that Joel said to uh, Hedda the night of uh, the night when Lisa was killed was, hasn't this gone on far enough? Right. He was holding her dead body in the arms, showing it to showing her to Lisa, uh, Hedda, saying, this is your child. Right. Hasn't this gone on far enough? What is this that he was referring to? What was going on far enough? What had reached a point where they were like, hasn't this gone on far enough? I would really be interested to know what they were talking about, because it's my contention after reading what Lisa knew. And you have to read it. Not only is it fairly explicit, but there's a lot between the lines in in the in this book. It's amazing. I would I would absolutely buy this book to glean to get an insight into this case that you will not get from any other book. And this may end up being another, you know, ultimate evil that we end up kind of disproving. I don't know if we're gonna do the deep dives. Let me get bigger here. I don't know if we're gonna do the deep dive into this as we're doing with Son of Sam, because you know. I just have a feel for Son of Sam that I don't have for any other case. But this is a case that intrigues me because of the connections. The fact that Joel Steinberg was from Yonkers of all places, that he that there are whispers and hints of cult activity, child trafficking, on these this weird sort of underground adoptions that are happening. You know, I know that Kathleen came on and spoke to us about that, but still it wasn't a normal adoption. And I think within that nexus of the weird adoptions, the rumors of child pornography and trafficking, sadomasochism, cults in Long Island. I think we're going to go a lot further here proving Maury Terry correct than we than we ever could in Son of Sam, where a lot of his theses is, are proving to be just fall flat completely on their face. So are there any? Uh, yep, yeah, Moet, I'm a Son of Sam head forever. <laughs> So let's see some of the uh, some of the comments here. Um, oh my goodness, it's the peds paying homage to one another. I mean, listen, it could be right. And here's this: the mouse is screaming. That bothers me now as an adult. Yeah, totally. Let's go back to that to that picture uh, right here. That's not normal to put in a children's book, a dying, screaming mouse being caught in the clutches. There's some psychological insight in this that you can glean, right? Here's Eric. Uh, Eric, what's up? Right um, Professor Hamamoto just clicked my mind. He said, Joyce Johnson, the authoress of the book, What Lisa Knew, is part of the Beat Generation. Oh, in interesting. The... Okay. Now, Charles... Professor, if you want, hold on. Professor, if you want, if you're still watching, Professor, just call in. Here's the uh, here's the thing. Maybe we can get you on with Eric. So I'm sorry, Eric. Go ahead. The thing that made my mind click is that I know people, major figures in the Beat Generation, trying to get a new uh, updated biography of Kerouac, at, like uh, whom I admire. But uh, Charles Upton, who had been a Beat poet, he's the metaphysician I've spoken to you about before, knew of the Carr family. I don't know if you saw what I said. There was the Carr family, a different, we don't know if they're related. Okay. Uh, who was a beat, Lucian Carr. 
And these people were into also certain types of the, within the beats, there was a faction that was into sexual orientations of the sexual liberation that began in France to nullify pederasty and pedophilia as terms and to say it was normal, like Allen Ginsberg. Well, Ginsberg was sick. I mean, talk about spiritually yeah. sick. Well, I mean, Lucien Carr's son, an author, or it might be Lucien Carr who's the author, the son, yeah. had an obsessive interest in the Son of Sam case and the cause. Really? I wonder whether they were related. Yeah, I, I don't know. It might have got lost in the shuffle when I said that. That's what Charles Upton, I put it on locals. I put what Charles Upton had written to me. So it's a, you don't, we don't know. Uh, I think one of the cause was insane, but the, the, the son is a prolific writer, but he was focused for a while on the son of Sam case. Now, I don't know if there's a relationship. You know, if you go back genealogically, everybody with the same name could be related and never know each other. Sure. But it's just, it's just very interesting. The professor Hamamoto said Joyce Johnson was with the beats and they were into the sexual revolution some of them of the french whom we all thought were ever so interesting and we didn't know they were for children male child uh, adult child love mm -hmm. and so uh it's it's just uh it's just a very interesting ah, lucien car yeah so it's lucien car's son right who, who was very interested in that if you go on the locals Okay. This is where I wrote to Charles Upton, a, a few people, uh, I put what Charles Upton wrote to me. He said, wait a minute, because there's also a tie in with with an, with somebody there, maybe Lucien Carr, and wanting to take Peter Lavenda as a child who was gifted, and another man, Jack Sarfati, as children away from their families to use them in a special think tank uh experimental type of uh orientation they didn't take lavenda because his father had been with a very far right group in indiana but mm -hmm. sarfati was taken away and he's a big man in one of the disclosure projects which upton is against so uh i'll go through locals or, or get the email again from upton and give it to you in our regular electronic mail message it's very very interesting it's cool it's, you know you and Professor Hamamoto should hook up uh, for sure. I think you guys would actually get along quite well and, you know, maybe do a show together. But um, I wouldn't mind hooking up with him. He seems rather uh, very much a gentleman and rather shy, uh, much much like the Englishman in Canada who's who never even speaks to anybody. He's afraid, David Hawkins, but nevertheless. I'm not so sure that the professor is shy because, uh, I don't know, I see him as a rock and roller type of dude. But anyway, he's a cool guy and a friend of the show. What so. does he mean dropping the Gifted Kids program pill? Is that negative, criticizing me? or the, the uh, Eric dropping this? Uh, I have no idea. Ralph Dude's a friend, though, so he he's probably not not uh, not trying to troll us. Yes, yeah, so in other words, dropping it out of interest. Because I'm not- So Eric- yeah, Eric. What did you think of those fo those drawings of Hedda Nussbaum? Now she didn't draw them, but she approved them. They that's were in her book. Said, that's why I said in one of the chats we should look into and see if this Joe Mathieu is still alive. But as I wrote, illustrators and authors up until that time, pre-internet, the seventies, the sixties, they worked. It goes back to the seventeen hundreds, even further. Illustrators and authors always worked together. The illustrator got into the mind of the author's writing. Right. I mean, a particular reason why an author, or in her case, an authoress, chose an illustrator. There was a commonality of interest. One writes with images. Here we get to the symbology of Craig Fitzgerald. And one writes with words. Right. You know, what do you think of this? What do you think of this cover? It's, you know what it reminds me of? This fascination that people have that plants will overtake somehow human biology. Mm -hmm. There's been certain type of underground science or even films in Hollywood where plants overtake the human, human life or that a new type of uh, biological entity is going to be created of plant human. Right. I had a friend who wrote a screenplay, Venus Flytrap. I, I pulled out of the film. I, I, I told him <laughs> he, he wanted to be a big man. And I said, take it easy, boy. And I left, but not because of the subject. But I think I think there's something else there. 
there's something far else there it, it you know it's almost like it's almost like children's books it's like a child's book but yet there's something subliminal there it affects yes. the little baby's mind i agree there's no way in hell that if i was a responsible parent that i would have bought my kid this book there's just no way i mean that's a scary picture in front that's a picture of of, of murder you not a murder but killing the beauty of roses and flowers yeah and, and even look at the night sky it's not even sunny it's a dark gray sky it's a Ooh. venus flytrap it's boggy because you know Almost those as if they're on the water venus flytraps live in bogs right so this is like an airless environment yeah, like they've gone underwater underwater sea life uh, yeah well this isn't underwater but yeah this is but but venus flytraps the reason they eat insects is because they they live in very poor wet soil with no minerals in it so they have to get their mineral content from the ant from the fly but i don't know i think out of all the all the pictures that they could have chosen why this one and i think it speaks to a certain mindset of this spiritually sick woman had a nussbaum and to me in my mindset and the way that i think the this front cover and this picture of hedda and mitchell are the exact same thing i'm seeing the exact same thing also huh? was a venus flytrap was i think a slang name also for a certain type of pill that excited the female no that was spanish fly a spanish fly right yeah, but i always subliminal there and i'm not the type to read in darkness but you neither don't... am i but this 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 blew up at me when i saw it for the first time i just realized um there's something not right here and that's why i kind of wanted to do a show on this Mm, mm, mm. anyway are there is there anybody out there in the audience who wants to call in please feel free and in, in that's the son who had the in sheila and just told her. he had the great interest in the son of sam case okay caleb carr isn't yeah. caleb carr an author he wrote the alienist yeah yeah right okay so what I, what, what, when i've rested after this i'll send you personally that electronic mail message charles gave me sure uh and um and uh well great show great thank show. you Boys. thank you i'm gonna i'm gonna take it on out eric so listen i'm sure that you and i will be on some sort of pop-up pretty soon and uh we'll definitely be in touch uh for sure this week all right my buddy Mike codella was in good form he looked very rested yeah but he's a bless you all okay eric thank you so much my friend Kamamoto, get in touch with me telephone me God all right bless you. all right thanks Bye. all right guys so I want to say thank you so much, Melissa, Moet. We really appreciate it. Professor Hamamoto, we always love when you participate. Small town girl, my, my friend Ruby, of course, Dorothy. Yay, Dorothy's in the house. We love Dorothy and all her wonderful emails that she sends me, which are always so positive and nice. So I want to just say thanks again. For those on um, locals, this this uh, week I'm going to be doing, I think it's scheduled for Thursday at noon, I'm going to be doing the first of the Caveman Chronicles, where we're going to be showing you all of, uh, I digitized and scanned all of the Caveman's negatives from Untermeyer Park taken in the 80s. So we have a whole crop of new and actually really good photographs. The guy, Caveman is a very interesting person, um, extremely uh, talented photographer. And um, we're also going to be hearing overlaid over that some brand new audio of the caveman that we recorded uh, where he talks a lot more freely about the things that he saw. So anyway, um, and we are, of course, dealing with uh, next Manny Monday next week is going to be the uh, Lorenzo documents. And I highly suggest again, um, you know, again, I'm, I'm this is in the spirit of cooperation, friendship. Uh, hopefully the name calling stops because I don't like being called names by people and it makes me very angry and it makes me not want to be your friend. Uh, but I suggest that people go see uh, uh, Professor Dad's um, uh, uh, live stream that came out yesterday where he deals with the Lorenzo files because he's the first person who actually took this seriously out there besides us. And for that, he should be commended because if we're going to find answers in son of Sam folks, it's going to be found on with these police reports and on the streets in Yonkers. Mm -hmm. So everybody out there, I want to say thank you. Remember your homework assignment is to buy a used copy of what Lisa knew by Joyce Johnson, read it, familiarize yourselves with it. 
And um, as we continue on in this uh, in this uh, series on the Steinbergs, that's going to be the book that we work out of because there's a lot in there that really, really gives a different perspective on the Lisa Steinberg case. All right, guys. Having said that, I want to say thank you so much. We really, really appreciate all your time, attention, and of course, to the paid subscribers, we really appreciate you as well, because without you, none of this would be happening. So if you guys would, wouldn't mind uh, going to Locals and signing up, and also in the description of this video is all of Mike Codella's um, links as well, the link to his book and the link to his YouTube channel. All right, guys. Well, if you want to reach out to me, you, you all know where to reach me. You can just email me or message me on Locals. I will be seeing you guys on Locals. Uh, we're doing the pop-ups now for members only. And I'll see the rest of you on the next Manny Monday. Thank you so much.